Throughout wrestling's rich history, there are tons of examples of guys who are made men from a the moment they debut. It's easy to look at guys like Randy Orton and The Big Show and The Rock and see why they were deemed future world champions from the beginning. But because of the laws of nature, that means there are plenty of guys in wrestling who aren't as lucky. But sometimes, creativity, sheer force of will, or just dumb luck can help a wrestler transcend whatever limitations the standards of time had placed on them. Whether it be because of their look, their size, backstage politics, or whatever, these are the ones who would go on to become legends in spite of their hurdles. And this week, I'm going to rank them the top 8 biggest overachievers in wrestling. Number 8. Daniel Bryan in WWE's recent history of making stars, there may be no more perplexing of a case than the former Brian Danielson. After traveling the world and doing all there was to do in Ring of Honor, the American Dragon finally moved to WWE in 2009. Debuting for mainstream audiences as part of NXT one year later, Brian was repeatedly made fun of for being small, not having a ton of charisma, and for not owning a television. Where's your personality? Where's your charisma? How are you going to become a star in the WWE? But it turns out that lots of fans were still rooting for him, his stock skyrocketing upon coming back from a release that summer that many felt was unwarranted. From there, Daniel was placed in a long-running series of storylines and feuds that focused on his smaller stature. Despite his share of accolades, like winning Money in the Bank and cashing in to become world champion, he still seemed to be treated like an afterthought. His blinking you miss it match with Sheamus at WrestleMania 28 was like a gut punch for his fans, but it actually helped launch him into the stratosphere. Ah, the Yes Chant, a very simple, incredibly over chant that fans were doing in and outside of wrestling arenas. WWE liked the chant so much, they were letting everybody do it, just because. Big Show, repaying the debt to the Rhodes. Oh boy. Yes. 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 But despite how much fans loved the wrestler and the chant, WWE seemed hesitant to actually give him the ball and run with it. A brief moment as champion was taken away at SummerSlam 2013, and from there it seemed the company was very much intent on taking the luster off of him, having him lose constantly. But somehow the chanting never died down. It hijacked their big belt ascension on Raw in December, and it totally dominated the Royal Rumble match he wasn't even in one month later. Plans of Batista and Randy Orton main eventing WrestleMania 30 by themselves were soundly rejected by the fans, forcing the company to change things up and offer a feel-good moment for the ages by inserting Bryan into the match and putting him over to become the champion yet again. Oh, they'll tell you that was their plan all along, and if you actually watch how they were booking it back then, either they're lying about it or they were just really bad at it. Brian was forced to retire due to lingering concussion issues in 2016, but through rehabilitation and sheer will, was finally able to get back into the ring after three years of inactivity. He had a rocky start creatively before winning the title again in late 2018 and portraying one of the most compelling heel characters in the company at that time. You can argue that Daniel Bryan doesn't have the size or look of a major wrestling star, but it's those intangibles you can't teach that have gotten him over as much as he has. Through sheer will and perseverance, he's overcome his size limitations to carve out an impressive career for himself, not once, but twice. Number 7. Chris Jericho it's hard to imagine the man who's a cornerstone for AEW today was once considered to be little more than a flashy babyface with no real chance of moving the needle on a grand scale. But that was certainly the case as Eric Bischoff spent the mid-1990s loading the WCW roster with fresh young talent to counter the older stars in the main event scene. Jericho didn't have much to chew on as a young, energetic babyface, but it wasn't until he became a tantrum-throwing heel in 1997 where people really began to take notice. Despite his entertaining antics as the conspiracy victim, the man of a thousand and four holds, and the star of Monday Night Jericho, it was clear that he wouldn't be allowed to break past a certain level, and Goldberg refused to engage in anything resembling a real feud with him, despite the fact that fans were clamoring for it. Jericho jumped ship to the WWF in the summer of 1999, but after an iconic debut, he had a rough first several months in the company thanks in large part to the politics at play during his program with China over the Intercontinental title. One such example was when Vincent Mann made him apologize to China for an accidental black eye during a match, as if they were in the principal's office. It turns out, feuding with the girlfriend of one of the top guys in the company puts you under greater scrutiny by management. <laughs> Who knew? Over time, Y2J became too big a presence to ignore, thanks to matches with his friends Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero, as well as the opportunities created with the Invasion storyline of 2001, reaching its peak when he became the first undisputed champion. Not bad for a guy who felt he was probably on his way out the door within his first year. No matter where he was in the car, Jericho remained a constant presence in the Federation until first leaving in 2005. 
After a two-year hiatus and a return that felt awfully derivative of what happened in 99, Jericho began his strongest run of the company in 2008 as a cold, sinister heel, waging epic battles with Shawn Michaels and becoming world champion several times over. Finally, having cemented his spot in the hierarchy, Jericho wisely realized the best way to stay fresh was to keep leaving and returning for limited runs, working with guys like CM Punk, Bray Wyatt, AJ Styles, and Kevin Owens. The coming and going also gave Jericho the chance to change up his gimmick all the time, becoming the David Bowie of wrestling of sorts with a constant shifting of personas and catchphrases. But Jericho finally solidified his place in history as an era-defining star when he broke ranks with WWE to face off with Kenny Omega at New Japan's Wrestle Kingdom 12. It was the international appeal of this match that made Jacksonville Jaguars co-owner Tony Khan realize the potential for another national wrestling company, eventually leading to the creation of All Elite Wrestling. And the rest, as they say, is history. From debuting as a bland babyface in WCW, to fighting for relevance in the WWF, to eventually being partially responsible for the birth of AEW, not to mention all the character evolutions in between, Chris Jericho's legacy in wrestling is more than secure. Well, unless he didn't like to sing along with MJF, I guess. Number 6. Diamond Dallas Page Unless they're jumping from one profession to another, it's neither common or advised for people to begin their in-ring careers in their mid-30s. Learning how to bump is one thing, but it can take years to master the more subtle nuances of the business. But such was the case with Diamond Dallas Page, who begun his career as both an announcer and possibly the most physically imposing manager in history in the late 80s. And I thought I was taller than most of my guys. Page entered the WCW power plant in 1991, hoping to start a career as the oldest full-time rookie pro wrestler at the age of 35. Page didn't do much in the first few years of his career, but for better or for worse, his fortune seemed to pick up when his friend and next-door neighbor, Eric Bischoff, took the reins of WCW in 1993. That isn't to say that DDP didn't work hard to constantly improve his work and expand his character, though, as he often sat under the learning tree of such luminaries as Dusty Rhodes and Jake Roberts. After a run with the TV title throughout 1995 and 96, which included lots of matches with Johnny B. Bad, DDP's biggest turning point came when he rejected the offer of the New World Order, becoming one of WCW's biggest babyfaces in the process. It's a fish. Hey! No! No, no, I can't believe what I'm seeing! DDP was off to the races, and his status as one of the few homegrown stars in WCW at that time was cemented by his feud with Randy Savage, who allowed Page to be portrayed as his equal. In 1998, he was given the chance of a lifetime to feud with Hollywood Hogan in a pair of celebrity tag team matches, teaming with Karl Malone at Bash the Beach and Jay Leno at Road Wild. That both matches with the drizzling shits is irrelevant because it was an opportunity for DDP to get that precious mainstream exposure that other wrestlers could only dream of obtaining at the time. Eventually, Page would earn major validation by becoming a three-time WCW champion, along with his many other accolades in the company before it went under in 2001. While some might view Page's main event push as a symbol of the fortunes of the company deteriorating, or another example of Bischoff's tendency to favor his friends at the expense of the business, the fact that he made it to the top of the most heavily loaded roster in history after such a late start to his entering career is a testament to Page's hard work and perseverance to constantly improve his craft. Number 5. Mick Foley Mick Foley grew up watching the WWWF in the days before the national expansion, deciding to become a wrestler himself after witnessing Jimmy Snuka do a superfly dive off the top of the steel cage in Madison Square Garden as a teenager. Ironically enough, it would be a similar but even more reckless stunt on the top of a cage 15 years later that would finally set him towards securing his position as one of the top stars in the most successful era in wrestling history. Despite never achieving what you would call a superstar build, Foley would grow out of his enhancement status over time and make his name as Cactus Jack, working smaller regional promotions before finally landing in WCW. A series of matches with Sting, his wild and original promos, and his willingness to go to any lengths for a match gained him a lot of respect among the boys and the fans. But despite his sacrifices, including losing one of his ears during a match with Vader in 1993, WCW did little to show how much they appreciated him, especially once Hulk Hogan came to town. A frustrated Foley left his six-figure job to work for ECW and IWA Japan before Vincent Mann went against his own instincts and hired him at the behest of Jim Ross in 1996. Under a twisted leather mask as Mankind, he became the first guy in years who was allowed to truly dominate The Undertaker, and the first one since Yokozuna to be any good at it. They would revisit their feud off and on for the next few years, peaking of course with their Hell in a Cell match at King of the Ring 98, where Mankind famously defied death and created perhaps the most famous clip in the history of the company. 
Not only was Mick willing to put everything on the line for the Federation and its fans, he also got to show off his range, not just as mankind, but as his childhood creation of Dude Love and his original incarnation of Cactus Jack. The three faces of Foley have gone on to become one of Mick's greatest calling cards. Unlike what happened in WCW, Foley would eventually be rewarded for his sacrifices in the Federation, becoming a three-time champion, being featured in the main event of WrestleMania 2000, and going down as one of the most beloved performers in WWF history, all despite never having the look of someone like The Rock or Steve Austin. And lest we forget the revival of his entering career years later in TNA, wrestling matches well after his retirement in 2000. Crazy or overachieving? You be the judge. The best way I can sum up McFoy's career is like this. He probably never needed to take all those crazy risks during his career, but the fact that he took them is what put him over the edge as one of the all-time most respected legends in wrestling. Number 4. Rey Mysterio With the power of hindsight, it seems kind of silly to put Mysterio on this countdown. He's arguably the most popular and influential luchador of the modern era, with an insane portfolio of matches to his credit. But when he first arrived in the US wrestling scene, I don't think his success could have been predicted. His first mainstream exposure came from ECW in 1995, when Paul Heyman brought in he and Psychosis for a series of fast-paced, high-flying matches, the kind that most American fans at the time just weren't used to seeing. By the summer of 96, Ray was brought into WCW and became the centerpiece of their burgeoning cruiserweight division. Along with the other cruiserweights at the time, Mysterio's matches were incredible aerial clinics that caused channel flippers to stop on Nitro and help expand the appeal of WCW. By 1999, the WCW brass made the not-so-wise decision for him to unmask on pay-per-view. While it was still a bad call no matter how you slice it, somehow it didn't kill Ray's career, because despite resembling a strangely jacked 12-year-old boy, he could still deliver in the ring. After WCW folded, it took months of prodding from people within WWE to convince Vincent Mann that Mysterio would be an asset leading to his signing in 2002. Despite standout matches with the likes of Kurt Angle and Eddie Guerrero, there definitely seemed to be a ceiling for Ray, partly due to his size and partly because his promo skills were still lacking. But like so many others on this list, Ray's ability in the ring and his natural charisma beyond scripted promos did a lot to keep him popular with the fans. In particular, the Latino viewers, who are growing in number with the presence of Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero. But after Eddie's tragic passing in November of 2005, Ray was deemed as the chosen one to carry the torch and bring honor to Eddie's name. Though Ray's road to the title was muddled with the awful Eddie's in Hell storyline, and despite Vincent Mann reportedly hemming and hawing on actually giving him the belt until the day of the show, Rey Mysterio became the smallest World Heavyweight Champion in history at WrestleMania 22. Even before Eddie's death, there was still a good portion of fans who believed that Ray deserved to be in the conversation for World Champion. But when they finally gave him the belt, there was a problem with his reign. Well, one of many, actually. WWE still had this belief that smaller guys couldn't be effective world champions, and his booking <laughs> certainly reflected that. As I've mentioned before in great detail, Ray was often made to look weak against much larger guys like Mark Henry and the great Khali, and it's no wonder many fans were convinced that Ray was not a top-tier talent. He was far from the first smaller champion to get beaten down by monsters, but I don't think it had ever been done to this embarrassing of a degree. Despite this, Ray remained one of the most marketable and versatile stars in the roster for years to come, and would even win top gold a couple more times. Ray would leave the company in 2014 and spend many years as a free agent, working for New Japan, Lucha Underground, and performing in the main event of All In before returning to the soap opera stylings of WWE. What makes Ray such a great overachiever isn't just how he transcends his small stature, but for his insane longevity in the business. Ray has been wrestling at a very high level for 30 of his 45 years on this earth, and has overcome several injuries along the way. Who can forget all those surgeries on his left knee? This tenacious luchador hasn't hung up his mask just yet, but should be admired for being able to continue performing to this day blinded or otherwise. Number three, The Miz. All I gotta say is, this guy managed to marry this woman. I rest my case. Okay, I'll talk about the wrestling too. Mike Mazanin burst onto the scene on season 10 of MTV's The Real World, where viewers caught the very first glimpse of what would become The Miz. Cause I am the fucking Miz, and The Miz does not break, do you understand me? Oh, God. In what could be seen as WWE grasping at anyone with mainstream cred, Mazanin was chosen to take part in the Million Dollar Tough Enough back in 2004. Miz was the runner-up, but no one could have predicted he'd have a much better career than the guy who won. Despite getting more seasoning in Deep South than OVW, The Miz was not welcomed with open arms by the established WWE guys, having famously been thrown out of the locker room on more than one occasion. But The Miz's resolve would not break, as he would go on to become a mainstay on SmackDown and ECW despite the setbacks in the locker room and some cringeworthy promos early on. 
as time went on, his push on Raw was seen negatively by many fans who felt he was unworthy of a spot in the card because of his background and perceived ability. And never was that feeling greater when he cashed in his Money in the Bank contract to become the 40th man to win the WWE Championship in 2010. Hands up if you were actually happy to see him win. Anybody? Anyone? Ah, well. After his program with John Cena that peaked at WrestleMania 27, Miz spent years wallowing in mediocrity, constant jobs, and a disappointing babyface run, leaving many to wonder what the point of Miz as champion even was at all. But that all changed when he began working alongside his wife Maurice in 2016, leading to a career resurgence as the face of the Intercontinental title scene. And years later, the Miz is still chugging along, back with his old tag team partner John Morrison, he's the holder of the Money in the Bank for a second time as of this recording, and is a cornerstone of WWE's life lineup of reality TV shows. Well, you might not care about them, but there's people out there who do. In all seriousness, The Miz is quite possibly the company's most consistent media ambassador, a public relations dreamboat. He does all the media appearances, he does the movies, he hosts the TV shows. There's not a camera that Miz has turned down. The ability to balance that kind of media schedule with the grueling wrestling schedule is something only the truly driven can do. If that's not overachieving, I don't know what is. Number two, Jeff Jarrett. This may come off as a dig, but I truly believe that there are few wrestlers who have been able to do as much in the business with as many handicaps working against him as Jeff Jarrett. As a son of longtime Memphis promoter and booker Jerry Jarrett, Jeff was the heir apparent to one of the most successful territories of them all. It seemed as though young Jeff was on a path to stardom in the territory, but then the 80s happened and suddenly the kingdom Jeff was expecting to inherit wasn't flourishing like it used to. Thanks to a deal that his dad made with Vincent Mann, Jeff came into the WWF in 1993, not as the white meat baby face he had portrayed for the duration of his run in Memphis, but as a Porter Wagner inspired country star. While Double J certainly falls under the category of occupational gimmicks that plagued the promotion, a musical gimmick is far less of a burden than say, a garbage man, race car driver, or whatever Mantar was supposed to be. Jarrett would become Intercontinental Champion, but would leave and return to the company a couple times over due to creative differences. This began a pattern that would dominate Jarrett's career for the duration of the Monday Night Wars, one where he was essentially a perpetual free agent after spending a year or two at a time in each company before inevitably jumping ship. After a short stint in WCW, Jarrett returned to the Federation in the fall of 1997 and immediately put his foot in his mouth, declaring Steve Austin's famous 316 catchphrase and merchandise as blasphemous. This basically eliminated any chance of him working in the main event as long as Austin was around. By 1999, Jarrett was the record holder for most IC title reigns and was in the thick of a big old misogyny storyline. Sure, it was cringeworthy, but give him credit for committing to it. I was always told that a woman's place was in the kitchen. This Are interview. you a woman? Come on, Jeff. Trying to tell a man how to do a man's job? What are you doing, skank? Jarrett had greener pastors waiting for him in WCW, finally getting the chance at the world title he was never given in the Federation. But even that wasn't without its hurdles. In a world that included guys like Scott Steiner and to a lesser extent Vince Russo as the company's top heels, it was hard for Jarrett to break out of those shadows despite winning the world title numerous times. As the late Mike Graham famously said, He broke 6,000 guitars, never drew a dime. But that didn't stop Jarrett from soldiering fourth after WCW folded. Having essentially burned his bridge in the only remaining national company, Jeff and his father Jerry created their own wrestling company with Blackjack and Hookers. As an executive and a wrestler in TNA, Jeff factored heavily in the fortunes of the company, as inconsistent as they may have been. Though Jarrett's style seemed outdated as the wrestling world evolved around him, and he may never have received universal acclaim as a main eventer, his ability to stay employed for so many years of his career, not to mention being responsible for the employment of so many others since 2002, has to account for something. He managed to survive business decisions that would have killed the careers of less savvy men, and for that I believe he truly does deserve to be in the conversation as one of the smartest people in the business. Before I reveal the number one overachiever, here are a few honorable mentions. The Jobbers. When I was first thinking of people to fill this list, my mind kept going to the lovable jobbers of yesteryear who were able to carve out their own place in wrestling history, so I felt it was only fitting to put them somewhere on this countdown. From the Brooklyn Brawler to Barry Horowitz to Iron Mike Sharp and everyone in between, jobbers have been part of the fabric of pro wrestling for decades, but only the really good ones get to live on forever in the minds of fans. 
and sometimes all it takes is a good gimmick to become a good hand for life. Dwayne Gill was a job guy for years in the WWF, but when they turned him into Gilbert in late 98, it kept him paid for decades. The Mean Street Posse were a couple of actual childhood friends of Shane McMahon when they were brought in in 99, but eventually they got better in the ring and stayed with the company in some form for around three years. And until his recent legal troubles and allegations made him persona non grata, who can forget when James Ellsworth Mania dominated SmackDown in 2016? When it comes to guys who lasted well beyond their shelf life in the best possible way, you gotta give it up to the jobbers who got over. Matt Hardy up until around five years ago, Matt Hardy was usually the brother who got fewer headlines, both for good and bad reasons. Then came Broken Matt Hardy. It's over! Oh, what began as a strange little storyline on Impact Wrestling soon became a strange big storyline that had almost completely enveloped the company by the time the brothers left in 2017. From there, Matt showcased his broken brilliance not just in Ring of Honor and WWE, but most recently in AEW. If nothing else, the broken gimmick kept Matt relevant, popular, and gainfully employed at a point in his career where some would begin to wind down. But when you think about it, ever since running the trampoline promotion with Brother Jeff as kids, Matt has always been a very creative personality. Look at his work as version one or Big Money Matt, and you'll know that Hardy has always tried keeping a finger on the pulse of what can get over in wrestling. Jeff may have earned the early accolades of this daredevil style, but Matt's career path can best be described as slow and steady, almost always trending upward. And the number one overachiever in wrestling is Triple H. For better or for worse, this man has played the game better than almost anyone in professional wrestling and has recovered from a wide variety of setbacks to become one of the top dogs of the industry. Hunter Hearst Helmsley debuted for the WWF in May of 1995, presented as a snobbish Greenwich elite. If there's one thing Vincent Mann is good at, it's taking shots at the man while still comfortably remaining the man. Helmsley was set for a big push in 1996 for the King of the Ring victory, but that plan went up in smoke when he incurred the political consequences of the infamous Madison Square Garden curtain call. He spent the next several months in a downward spiral of suctitude, losing the majority of his matches in increasingly embarrassing fashion. But in a bit of irony, his association with the clique not only led to his burial, but also his eventual emergence as the top star in the company as one of the founding members of Degeneration X. By 98, Shawn Michaels was out with a back injury, leading to Triple H's continued ascension up the ranks. After a heel turn in 99, Triple H had become world champ for the first time, but his spot in the main event wasn't sealed until he entered a feud with Vincent Mann, culminating with a surprise marriage to Vince's daughter, Stephanie. Get a nice shot of the brand new Mr. and Mrs. Hunter Hearst Helmsley. As the storyline relationship eventually turned into real love behind the scenes, Triple H became the biggest pushed heel in the company since Billy Graham in the 1970s. A devastating quadricep tear put a stop to his run in 2001 and could have even ended his career. Despite this, Triple H came back bigger than ever, literally resuming his place on top. Triple H, of course, would come to dominate the company for the rest of his active career, and some would attribute that to his marital status. But as much as I rip on him for the reign of terror, I find that criticism mostly unfair. Even before Stephanie was part of the picture, Triple H was on his way to becoming one of the top three acts alongside Austin and Rock in an era that was filled with all-time greats. As the years went on, Triple H would keep bouncing back from other horrific injuries, like a second quad tear, a torn pectoral muscle, and more, before eventually becoming an executive in the company. From debuting in WCW with a terrible French accent, to suffering the slings and arrows of wrestling politics and injuries, to marrying into the industry's most powerful family and heading up one of the company's most popular brands, that takes effort. And that's why I have to admit that Triple H is possibly the biggest overachiever in professional wrestling. Who would I leave out? Let me know in the comments section below. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.